Hello students, thanks for watching and listening. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and I'm going to talk today about arguments by analogy and how to evaluate them. So first, let's just review what is an analogy. Uh, it's a form of comparison, and if you've taken the SAT, then you're familiar with analogies. You have questions like, dog is to puppy as cat is to blank, and the answer there is kitten. Um, the relationship between dog and puppy is the same as the relationship is between cat and kitten. So you have others, things like hat is to head as glove is to hand. Sail is to boat as engine is to car, right? The sail is a means by which the boat moves. The engine is the means by which the car moves. So an analogy is a form of comparison. It's a form of comparing two things in order to... Um, use that comparison to learn more about one of those objects. That is, if you understand the principles, the characteristics, the nature of this one thing, this one object or situation, then by applying those that same reasoning, that same logic to something that is similar in certain important ways, you can learn about that second thing. So some examples, uh, like a doctor might say, People take your, their car in for servicing and checkups every few months in order so that uh, they can keep their car running well so it won't uh, break down. You should do the same thing for your body. That's what going to the doctor is like. It's like getting a checkup for your car, but instead for your body. So that's making an argument, right? It's arguing that there's something analogous between your body and a car. Um, there's something analogous between getting your car checked out and regularly uh, tuned up and maintained as to getting your body regularly checked and maintained by a doctor. Um, and that there's the same similarity in the benefit of taking care of your car as the benefit of taking care of your body. If we wanted to break it down into a series of statements, of premises almost, we would say people should take their cars in for regular servicing in order to prevent major problems. People's bodies are like their cars in that human bodies like cars are physical objects and they are complex systems that can develop problems over time if they're not properly maintained and, and regularly checked up. Therefore, if they are alike in that way, they are uh, that you should treat your body in the same way that you treat your car, that is taking it to get checked up regularly in order to prevent those breakdowns. So it's a, a simple sort of process, but argument by analogy is something that's very easy to abuse. And that's because really it's one of our fundamental ways of thinking. We, we think by applying past situations to our current experiences in order to understand, well, how is this situation like what happened before? So analogous thinking really is part of our, our very basic fundamental means of perceiving the world. And that means that it can fall victim to the same problems of that our perceptions can. That is, we might mistake the important similarities, mistake the ways in which things are similar or different, and thus not really uh, apply an analogy correctly or not, not use an analogy, not use the proper um, analogous comparison to understand the situation. For example, someone might say that uh, different races among humans are like different breeds of dogs in that they look differently and they come from different areas. But that ignores some very important differences between humans and dogs, um, and it really picks up on the wrong similarities, right? There's a far greater difference between dog breeds than there are between human races. Uh, another very famous example, um, this is from the 1980s, here in Texas, a conservative candidate for governor made a joking analogy, said that sexual assault was like bad weather, and that if you, in that you couldn't do anything about it, so you might as well just enjoy it. Um, as you can imagine, that joke was, did not go over very well, and it basically ended his, um, his political career. Uh, as it should have. And while he intended it as a joke, and of course it's not a funny joke, um, he was making an argument, and an, an ana argument by analogy. The problem was, is he was uh, uh, 
picking up on a trivial similarity between sexual assault and bad weather and using that to essentially trivialize sexual assault. So analogies are very, very tricky uh, as, as any sort of argument because we have to be careful about what the similarities and differences between the things we're comparing are and how those similarities or differences are relevant to the conclusion we're trying to advance. And that's the purpose behind the uh, exercises that we did on identifying important similarities and identifying important differences, which people did would, did quite well on. Um, the, it's important to know what the similarities and differences are between, it, between two things because that's going to determine whether or not they're useful as com points of comparison for the analogy that you're making. So, for example, cooking a meal and living a life. Those are two of the ex uh, items, things that you were uh, tasked with inviting, uh, finding similarities and differences for. So let's say you could say, well, cooking a meal and living a life are similar in that while you can do them alone, it's much more enjoyable to do so, to do it with other people involved. And that if you do it all alone, while you may be successful in some sense, you'll ultimately be very lonely. And that's something that you could say about cooking a meal and living a life. Cooking a meal can often be very pleasant when you're doing it with other people. Um, it's more fun to cook and eat with other people. Similarly, living a life where you're completely isolated from others would be quite miserable, whereas having friends, family, etc., is important to one's happiness. So that's a if a sort of simple and, and banal example. That's a, that's a um, decent analogy, right? It's not anything profound, but it's a decent analogy. But if you said, well, cooking a meal and living a life are similar in that you only do it once and at the end you die. That's not a good analogy, right? Because you can cook many meals in your life and hopefully at the end of cooking a meal you don't die unless you've done something very wrong in your cooking. Uh, but you do only live one life and you die at the end of it. So that's not a good analogy, right? It's mistaking what's important about the similarities or differences between the two things and whether or not they're relevant to the conclusion that you're trying to make. So how do you evaluate an analogy? Well, you go through, as always, a series of questions, a series of steps. You ask yourself, in what ways are the two things that are being compared similar? So, for example, cooking a meal and um, living a life. How are they similar? Well, they're similar in that they both involve a number of steps. Uh, that you usually have to do in a certain way. They're both similar in that um, you can get advice on them in books. They're both similar in that variety makes them more pleasant, right? These are all ways in which cooking a meal and living a life are similar. Now, how are those similarities relevant to the conclusion? Are the similarities between living a life and uh, those similarities relevant to the conclusion that you can only do it once and you die at the end? No, none of those similarities have anything to do with um, the fact that you can only live your life once or that you will die at the end of it. So then you think, in what ways are the two things different? Well, cooking a meal is, an in, is a single process. Cooking a meal um, involves food uh, and ovens and heat, um, whereas living a life involves all sorts of other things. Living a life can go on for years, blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's an infinite number of differences, of course. Um, and the differences here are much more relevant to the conclusion than the similarities. So in that case, it's not a good analogy, right? The two things aren't similar in ways that are appropriate to the conclusion that's trying to be, be proved. With that in mind, get the uh, uh, assignment, the instructions for evaluating um, an arguments by analogy. Get those problems out if you've got them available. And we'll go through some of them, not necessarily in, in exact detail uh, between all of them, but we'll go through uh, some of them and discuss whether or not the analogies are, are strong or weak. So number one, the Earth supports living organisms. Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, is like the Earth in that both have large oceans of liquid water. Therefore, Europa supports living organisms. So simple question, simple analogy. Um, what are the things that are being compared? The Earth and Europa. What's the conclusion that's being advanced? Is that Europa, like the Earth, supports living organisms. We know that the Earth supports living organisms. Europa also does. 
and it because it's like Earth in what way? Well, that they both have large oceans of liquid water. So we ask ourselves, this similarity, they both have large oceans of liquid water, is that pertinent to the conclusion? Well, yes, water is necessary for life. Water is necessary for the support of living organisms. So that is relevant to the conclusion. But is water the only thing that is necessary for life? And does the water have to be, uh, does it matter what's in the water, right? Does it have to be water of a certain purity? Um, does it matter the temperature if the water is extremely hot or extremely cold, right? How do all these things and what are all the other many other elements that support life that are necessary for supporting life? And are they on Europa? Well, to the best of our knowledge, they're not. So since water is not the only thing, or rather even possessing large oceans of liquid water is not the only thing necessary to support living organisms, this is a weak analogy. It doesn't prove its point. Let's look at number two. The mugger who forces, forces me to give him my wallet is not entitled to my money. A nation that conquers another nation in an unjust war is like a mugger. Both use violence to take what they want. Therefore, a nation that conquers another nation in an unjust war is not entitled to that nation's resources. So the comparison that's being made here is between a mugger who forcing someone to give uh, uh, someone their money, a mugger robbing someone, and a nation conquering another nation in an unjust war. Um, and the person says, just as the mugger is not entitled to my money because they're using violence to take what they want, that they that they don't have a right to, neither is a nation entitled to um, take what it wants from another nation that it has conquered unjustly because it's also using violence. So we think about the similarities in this analogy and whether they're relevant to the conclusion. Um, the si similarity that's highlighted is violence, right? That violence is being used by one party against another party with no cause, except that the first party wants something that the second party has, right? It's very important that this says a nation conquers another nation in an unjust war, because it's not a nation conquers another nation in a just war, in a justified war. The fact that the war is unjust is what makes it similar to the mugging, right? A mugging is something that we classify as unjust because someone's taking something that's not theirs. So an unjust war is similar. They're both the use of force, use of violence to take something from someone else. Is that relevant to the conclusion? I would say that's very relevant, right? What is the problem with mugging is that it's violence. The problem with it, conquest is it's violence, right? What are the ways in which a mugger and a nation are different? Well, a mugger is one person. A nation is a collection of people. A mugger um, might not uh, actually harm you, uh, only threaten you with violence whereas a nation conquering another nation is actively using violence and, and military forces, and so there's necessarily going to be death and harm involved. So there are a lot of differences, but they don't really change the pertinence of the conclusion, right? They don't affect um, whether or not violence to take something from someone else is or isn't just. So in this case, this is a good analogy. The similarities that it highlights between the two uh, acts are important. They're they're pertinent to the conclusion, um, and so it, and the differences that are that are between the things are not really relevant to the conclusion. So it successfully makes its case. I would say. Let's look at number three. We all know that people should not drive while they are drunk. Texting while driving is like dri uh, driving while drunk in that both make people react more slowly to road hazards. Therefore, people should not text while driving. So this identifies only one point of comparison between driving drunk and driving while texting, or uh, texting while driving, I should say. Um, and that is they make you react more slowly to road hazards. Is that pertinent to the conclusion that you shouldn't do these things, right? Saying you shouldn't do both these things because the similarity is that they make you uh, react more slowly to road hazards. Yes, that's the prime reason why we say people shouldn't drive while drunk. It's because they'll react more slowly um, to road hazards, and thus that makes them more dangerous, so they shouldn't drive while drunk. If texting has the same effect, then it follows logically texting while driving is also a bad idea because it's something that will make you react more slowly to hazards in the road, 
thus making you more likely to get in an accident. Now, are there differences between texting and driving? Sure, there are many. Um, and perhaps the most significant one is that you can put down your phone. You can stop texting, but you can't suddenly stop being drunk. You can't suddenly sober up immediately uh, at will while you're driving. But does that, does that change the, the idea that um, because they make you react more slowly to road hazards that uh, you shouldn't do them? No, th that's not really a very pertinent difference. Um, even though it is significant in, in a sort of larger sense, it's not pertinent to this argument. You should still not text while driving, even though you can put your phone down. Let's move on to number four, um, which is a, a very bad uh, <laughs> rewriting of a famous idea by Karl Marx. Actually, has very little to do with what Marx actually said, um, but it's a, a funny little rewriting of it. Religion is like opium in that both give people an illusory sense of happiness or hope, even if their lives are not going well. But people shouldn't have anything to do with opium. Therefore, people shouldn't have, it, have anything to do with religion. So the comparison here is between opium and religion. It's saying they're similar in that they both give you this uh, illusory sense of happiness, but since you shouldn't have anything to do with opium, thus you shouldn't have anything to do with religion. So the question is, is this similarity the reason uh, pertinent to the conclusion that you shouldn't have anything to do with these things? Is the fact that opium gives you an illusory sense of happiness or hope, even if things aren't going well for you, is that the reason why people shouldn't do opium, why people shouldn't do heroin or other opiates? Uh, not really. I mean, some people might say that it's not good to live in a fantasy life, all your, a fantasy world all your life, um, but what's really the problem with opium uh, and opiates is that they're harmful to your health, that you can become addicted to them, that they can cause you to... Uh, lose your job, lose your family, give up everything in your life in order just to pursue the drug. Is that something that religion can cause you to do? Well, maybe. It might if you're in a cult, for example. Um, but in a general sense, is that something that most people who are religious do? Does it, could you become physically addic addicted to religion? Probably not. Do most people give up their families and lives to pursue their religious callings, uh, only if they're priests, and then it's something that's valued by society, uh, generally speaking. Um, but most people don't do that. Um, and of course, is opium, is religion uh, a physical uh, substance that you inject into your veins? No, it's obviously not. It's a cultural phenomenon. So there's very big differences between opium and religion, and at least the way this argument is posed here doesn't really seem to pick up on the pertinent similarities to make this case. So it's a weak analogy. It doesn't really make its case. It doesn't pick up on the important similarities between opium and religion. Uh, instead, it picks up on what I would say is a minor um, uh, similarity in order to make its case. Okay, now let's move on to number five, a more complex one um, in a certain sense. A geneticist injected pregnant mice with genes from a virus. As a result, the offspring's brain cells reacted differently to purines, which are naturally occurring chemicals in the body. When exposed to purines, the cells, including brain cells, would activate a stress response that made it harder for them to communicate with one another. Uh, these chronically stressed mice exhibited symptoms that are similar to those exhibited by autistic humans, such as avoiding strangers and novel situations. Thus, autism in humans might be caused by a hyperactive stress response by brain cells. So what is it that, what is the argument that's being made? Um, the conclusion is that autism might be caused by this uh, hyperactive stress response. Why? Because when mice have this hyperactive stress response, they avoid other people, they avoid each other, and they don't communicate with each other, they avoid novel situations, and those are behaviors that are typically um, displayed by people with autism. So it is an important similarity because it suggests that um, what's happening in the brains of the mice is uh, might be the same thing that's what's going on in the brains of the autistic people, and that if that's true, what causes the, the condition in mice might also be causing the condition in humans. But just displaying some of these behaviors 
that are typical of autistic humans and that are really um, uh, secondary uh, uh, symptoms, we might say, not necessarily fundamental aspects of aut autism and autistic uh, neuropsychology, that's not really the same thing as being autistic. So it seems like that's a bit of a stretch to make that comparison, right? It's taking rather superficial similarities in order to make a, uh, a very strong connection, a very strong argument about cause. Um, also, mice and, and the behavior of mice might be too simple to model something that's as complex as autism in humans. So this is probably a, a fairly weak weak argument by analogy. It makes too much of a stretch, um, and it relies on, again, superficial similarities to make its case. Okay, moving on to number six. The First Amendment does not protect the right to shout fire in a crowded theater when there is no fire. During a war, distributing pamphlets that encourage people to resist a military draft is like shouting fire in a crowded theater in that both present a danger to the public. Therefore, the First Amendment does not protect the right to distribute anti-draft pamphlets. So the comparison here between shouting fire in a crowded theater and encouraging people to resist the draft uh, says that both present dangers to the public and thus both should uh, be, uh, neither should be protected by the First Amendment. So what's the similarity here? It's saying that they both present dangers to the public. That's a little vague, though. In what way does shouting fire in a crowded theater present a danger to the public? Well, because people might trample each other, trying to get out, cause a panic, people get hurt, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? How is it that causing, that encouraging people to resist a military draft presents a danger to the public? Well, the only way in which it would present a danger to the public is if so many people resisted, so many people refused the draft, that the public, that the nation was unable to protect itself. Right? So those, I think, this, even in the similarity that's being made, it's such a, a limited similarity that it doesn't really, you know, the way in which they present dangers is totally different. We also might think about the reasons behind these activities. Why would someone shout fire in a, in a movie theater versus why would someone encourage others to resist a military draft? Well, when you shout fire in a, uh, in a crowded movie theater, the intention is probably harmful. The intention is negative. It's to play a prank. It's to cause disruption and chaos. But when someone encourages others to resist a military draft or protests a war or something like that, is the reason harmful? Is the reason negative? Is the reason to cause chaos? Uh, no, it's not, right? The reason is usually to protest violence, to encourage peace, to try to prevent death, right, uh, and, and conquest. So the reasons behind it are also fundamentally different, and that's really why shouting fire in a crowded theater is not protected by the First Amendment. It's because it's an intentionally harmful act, whereas encouraging people to resist the military draft is not an intentionally harmful act. So the similarity here is a superficial one. Again, it doesn't really hold up, uh, and the differences between them are far more important, and so really invalidates the conclusion. So I'll end there after doing the first six. I think you get a sense. Just to review, remember, analogy is a way, is a mode of comparison. It's a way of comparing two things and saying that because of their important similarities, the judgment or reasoning we use to understand object A then applies also to object B. They're alike in some way, so what we know about object A, we can then also apply to our knowledge of object B. So again, what's important in analogies are the similarities. What are the similarities between the, the things that are being compared? And are they relevant to the conclusion? There will always be differences, right? There will always be, and there will always be maybe even some major differences. There's no such thing as a perfect analogy. If there was, you'd be comparing something to itself, right? Every, if you're comparing two different things, there's obviously going to be some differences. So it's always going to be a matter of judgment. You have to determine whether the differences outweigh the similarities, whether the differences are more important, more pertinent 
to the conclusion being advanced um, and thus invalidate the argument? Or are the similarities the crucial ones, the important ones that really make the difference in determining what we know about object A? Are those the important characteristics that, that define our conclusion and thus allow us to also apply it to object B? So if you have any questions, um, of course, feel free to, to uh, contact me, uh, email, uh, come to my office, et cetera, et cetera. Um, otherwise, I will see you in the next presentation. Thank you for listening, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves.